I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. In the summer of 2007, I was a Boy Scout attending Scout Camp in a camp called Camp Morrison. My friend and I were walking back to our campsite, which was called Camp Billy Rice. It's right by the entrance to Camp Morrison. We were closer to Camp Ida Haven at this point, walking back from the waterfront. We stayed too late and it had gotten dark. As we passed over this stream, I saw something off to the right. We stopped on the small bridge and froze. I thought it was a guy in a ghillie suit at first, but he was crouched next to the stream, slowly drinking water from his hand. He turned and looked at us, then stood up straight, and I could see in the moonlight it was not a man in a ghillie suit, but he was covered in hair. He had really long arms and was about eight feet tall, maybe more. I could see the moonlight reflecting off his green eyes, and for the whole minute or two that we stood frozen staring at each other, he did not blink once. Then he turned away, crouched back down, and continued slowly drinking with his hand. My friend and I got scared and ran off. We never told anyone because we were scared and thought no one would believe us. I didn't perceive him as a threat, though, and I think he didn't perceive us as a threat either. The figure he and his friend saw from the bridge was 40 feet away. When it stood slowly, it was at least 8 feet tall, stocky with a short body and shoulders about 3 feet wide. In the moonlight, it appeared dark brown to black and did not have hanging hair, but bushy hair that covered its neck. It had long arms that extended to the knees. The thighs were the same length as from the knees down. The head was round, no ears, nose, or teeth were seen. No strange odor was detected. Besides these details, the witness reports vivid memory of some other details. The eyes were very large, but in proportion to the head. The eyes were green in the reflected moonlight. The figure had full lips that protruded far out. The witness saw a long thumb that was sticking out when the figure drank water from its hand. The witness was very confused about what he saw and did not go back to look for tracks. He and his friend mentioned it to the Boy Scout leaders, and they said it was a person in a ghillie suit or their imagination. The next day, the witness did ask a few other Boy Scouts if they saw someone in a ghillie suit the evening before, and they all said no. We were camped at an old abandoned mining town and mine near Deadwood Reservoir in October 1996. Our son had an encounter with an unidentifiable being. My husband's company was helicopter logging near an area that was once an old mining town out in the forest. It was opening day of deer season, and our son, who was 14 at the time, got up early to go hunting near camp. We were near Deadwood River, which was a little more than a creek. He took off with his rifle to see if he could get a buck that morning. He crossed the river and went up a hill to where he could get a better look at the river and flats below. Our pilots were camped down the river about a quarter mile from our camp. As our boy was looking down towards the pilot's camp, he observed what he thought was a bear down in the flats near the river. He thought that it was a little unusual that the bear was walking very steady on its hind legs, more like a human. The more he watched it, the more uncomfortable he began to feel. As he was watching it, it suddenly looked up and started staring back at him. He felt sudden fear race through him as he felt its eyes lock onto him. He told us that he had never felt a feeling like that before or since then. He said that it was very dark in color and was very tall and hairy. After it had stared at him for a time, it proceeded in walking towards where he was standing. Realizing that it was moving in his direction, he turned around and started racing for camp as fast as he could. When he got to camp, he ran into our trailer, shut the door and locked it behind him. He then closed all the curtains and blinds. He was absolutely scared to death that the thing that he saw was coming to get him. He wouldn't come out of our camper at all until I took him home two days later. He kept the door locked all the time and the curtains drawn, even in broad daylight. The other unusual thing that we noticed up there was the basement or boiler room of the old boarding house that was near our log camp. It looked like a huge nest in the corner near the old boiler. It was made of evergreen boughs and leaves. It looked like it had been slept in by a very large animal. The floor was soft dirt and had a very strong odor all over in that part of the building. It was opened to the outside by an open doorway. 
several other people working for the same logging company had different sightings and encounters within the same area and time frame, a couple of days apart as our son's encounter. At the time that our son had his encounter, the water truck driver also had an encounter. The evening of my son's encounter, the water truck driver came to our camp and told of a strange encounter the previous evening while filling his water truck about half a mile down river from our camp. He said that it was about 3 a.m. and he was waiting behind his truck for it to fill up. He had the floodlights on so he could see the hose in the water. He said that he had an overwhelming feeling that he was being watched. The Deadwood River is quite shallow and not very wide, so the other side of the river is very close, about 25 feet across. He told us that he looked up and across the river to a set of eyes that were watching him from behind a tree on the other side of the river. It was very large and dark and had very piercing eyes. He said that it was much taller than a man and moved upright and quietly from one tree to another, all the time watching him. He said that he had driven water trucks for many years and he had never encountered anything like that before. He put in his resignation the next day after his sighting. We also found out that others had had encounters of their own near our area. The logging boss and his two sons had something chased them down the hill above our camp the night before. They said that something was screaming at them from behind trees and rocks were being thrown as they were trying to get to camp. Since that time, we have heard hunters who have been in that area hunting. They tell us that they have smelled a really strong odor and have felt like they were being watched as they moved through the forest. This story begins when my son and I went bow elk hunting in September 2011 on the upper end of Coeur d'Alene River in Shoshone County of northern Idaho. We camped adjacent to Independence Creek at Trailhead 22. I hunted east of our camp off a of Forest Service Road 3099 as the crow flies no more than three quarters of a mile. When I left the road, the initial climb was very steep across open ground which led into a wooded area. At this point, I picked up a game trail, followed it as best as I could by placing trail tape as I went. My trail tape is pink with glow-in-the-dark striping. I located an elk wallow, which was being used often, so I concentrated hunting in that area. I usually hunted from the 1st to the 18th of September, and my son bow hunted through the end of the early bow season on the 30th of September. Neither of us got an elk during this time, so we planned to hunt again late in the bow season of the 10th to the 16th of December. I was apprehensive about hunting this late in the season at an elevation above 4,000 feet. We decided to take two vehicles for this reason. We departed on the 9th of December and 25 miles out from our hunting area came to the portion of the paved road where the county ceased plowing the fallen snow. We forged on and did manage to make it to a point about a half mile from where I was parked on the service road. We climbed up to where we would be hunting. That night we slept in the back of my son's Suburban and got up before dawn, strapped on our snowshoes and started up the road with bows in hand. The going was considerably tough on my snowshoes. We climbed up to the point where we picked up my trail tape, previously laid down in the woods, and slowly made our way. With heavy snow on the ground, following the trail tape was a must. A few times we lost the trail but managed to eventually find it with the trail tape. On one such occasion we managed to find the trail tape but here is where I was left wondering how in the heck my trail tape managed to end up 12 feet high in a tree, tied onto a limb extending out from the tree 6 feet, with a diameter of no more than 2 inches. I'm 5 foot 5 inches tall, unable to reach that high. All I could do was stand there and look at it. At the time there was 2 feet of snow on the ground, no tracks present, so it was really 14 feet from the ground. Later, I told a friend of mine who's a Bigfoot investigator. He related to me a story about a man hunting in Oregon on horseback who was also putting out fluorescent trail tape, only to find the trail tape tied to his horse's mane the next morning. We could not explain how my trail tape managed to be tied at that height. All I know is the only way it could be done by anyone else is if they carried an extension ladder up the mountain, and I can assure you, based on how steep it is, that did not happen. 2009 was the third year that I've been able to spend the whole hunting season in the mountains. I retired in October 2007. I pulled my camp trailer up 
the end of September and set it up for 36 days of camping, hunting, and sitting around the campfire enjoying the outdoors. I spend a lot of time camping and hunting by myself and riding my ATV on the few old logging roads that are still open to four-wheelers. At 12.24 on the seventh night, something woke me up and I sat up in bed. A minute or so later, the rear end of my camp trailer started rocking back and forth. All the stabilizer jacks were down and the trailer was solid, so whatever was pushing on the trailer was very strong. The fully loaded trailer weighed in at more than 5,500 pounds, and whatever was moving it was not making any noise while it rocked it. My first thought was a bear, a really big bear. I grabbed my shotgun and I put a shell in it and sat and waited for a few seconds. The trailer continued to rock back and forth, so I grabbed the air horn that was sitting on the table and gave it several blasts. This did not stop it, so I got the keys to my truck and pushed the panic button, setting the horn blaring. This stopped whatever it was, and all was quiet for five minutes. I sat there with my shotgun in my hands, listening for any sound. There was no sound, just total quiet. I had convinced myself that it was just a bear, when this god-awful sound came from the ridge behind the trailer. It started off like a whistle, turning into a horse whinny, and then going into a very loud howl, and finishing off with a growl. All of these sounds were run together with no pause in between them. It lasted maybe 10 to 15 seconds, and then all went quiet. Damnedest sound I ever heard scared the heck out of me. I got dressed and sat there in the dark the rest of the night, shotgun in hand. I have never had anything affect me like that before. After it was completely daylight, I went out to look at the back side of the trailer to see if there were any tracks on the ground. There were not any dents in the trailer or tracks on the ground. There should have been tracks because the ground was kind of soft and out of habit I had raked all the pine needles and forest duff away from the trailer, leaving just dirt and grass. I need to mention here that a 240 pound friend drove into my camp while I was still outside checking for tracks and looking for any damage to my trailer. He wanted to know what I was doing, so I told him the events of the past eight hours. I also went back inside and had him push on the trailer to see if he could rock it back and forth. The best he could do was give it a jolt by throwing a shoulder into it. He could not make it rock in the smooth motion that had occurred the night before. That particular event is what finally gave me the incentive to file a report, and largely because it's the first time I cannot affix any logical, rational explanation to it that would allow me to forget that it happened. There have been seven or so other odd happenings over the past 12 to 14 years that have taken place within a six-mile stretch of this road, involving six people. Two of those events involved the friend I mentioned earlier, with both ending in him being chased off the mountain. The first happened when he was walking out on an old skid road very late in the day after an afternoon deer hunt. He said he could hear something pacing him higher up on the mountain, and it followed him for about a mile or so, making sounds that he had never heard before. The second time was five to six years later, and in the summer. He had just finished cutting up a truckload of firewood and was taking a break before loading it when he heard the same sounds as before. The sound was quite a ways off but kept getting closer, so this time he decided that he would just sit tight and see exactly what it was. He had a three fifty seven Magnum revolver with him, and he just stood there waiting. After some time of listening to this sound getting closer and closer, he again let discretion be the better part of valor and jumped in his truck and left, leaving the wood he had just cut laying there on the ground. An old hunting partner of his was chased back into his camp trailer early one morning by something that made threatening sounds toward him in the dark. He said he never heard anything like that before, and he's also a lifelong hunter. An associate that worked at one of our mills said his wife saw a tall, strange-looking thing walking toward their campsite while he was out hunting. It turned and went into the forest before she could get a really good look at the face, but she said it was very tall and it was very dark from head to foot and not carrying a rifle. My son said he saw several barefoot human-looking but large footprints along a trail on the top of a ridge that overlooked the area where my friend left the truckload of firewood on the ground. My brother and I were camped on a point just a few miles down the road from this year's incident back in 1997 or 98. 
It was just after dark, and we were setting up the campfire, when across the creek and way up the ridge, we heard this god-awful scream or howl. It was so loud that it felt like it shook my shirt sleeves. After a few minutes of trying to rationalize what could have made that sound and not coming up with anything, he left and went into his trailer for the night. I put the fire to bed and then went into my trailer for the night. No brave people here either. Keep in mind that we've been lifelong hunters, and he was in his 60s then, and I was in my 50s. Two other occasions on previous years involved knocking or tapping on the side of my trailer. One happened at 2 in the morning, and a few years later, it happened again at 3 in the morning. On both occasions, there were no other camps within a mile or two of in either direction. No other noise was heard other than the three or four raps on the side of the trailer on both those occasions. My campsites are well off Forest Service roads, with the exception of one that is about 150 yards from the road. Also had a very bad smell going out an old skid road before daylight. Nothing there when coming back. This happened several times and always in the same area of the skid road at the bottom of the draw where my brother and I heard the scream or howl in 1997 or 98. Small rocks were thrown at my son while we were sitting on the side of our favorite ridge. Two ridges past the end of the skid road mentioned above. Animal and bird sounds going out on another skid road. Total quiet coming back out. This happened more than once on this skid road. We found a stick structure built off a of Forest Service Road 624, 14 miles away from the area mentioned above. My son rolled a large rock into a large bowl, 5 to 700 yards wide, just before dark, making a lot of noise, intending to scare out an elk. But instead, a very tall, solid, dark figure stepped out from behind a tree across the bowl from us, and after a few seconds, stepped back behind the tree again. My son rolled another rock, and the figure stepped out again for a few seconds. It then headed off away from the road as it was getting dark, walking on two legs. We watched this thing through a pair of binoculars, and it was uniform in color, top to bottom, and was not carrying a rifle. This happened 50 to 55 miles away from the area mentioned for all the other happenings. Every fall I drive up Highway I-15 from Southern California to Montana to hunt with friends there. I tend to find myself stopping in Pocatello, Idaho for a motel and also visit a certain bar there. Twice I have run into a man I will call Gary. I had a casual conversation with Gary at the bar in November 2011. Now before I go on, I want to mention we were drinking beer and no other kind of liquor is served there. He and I had just happened to walk in about the same time and then started talking, so we were not intoxicated. Since I met him a year prior, I felt like this was an instance of synchronicity, and maybe there was something special he was about to share with me. So I asked him some questions. Not able to repeat the conversation verbatim, these are the answers and stories I got from him, which I wrote down an hour later when I got back to my room. I asked him if he was Native American. He said yes, half Bannock Indian and a tribal member. His age was early 50s. When I asked him if he had ever seen a Bigfoot, he snapped back a bit and then turned his back to me. I thought to myself, here's another person who might think I'm a nut job. But then Gary turned around slowly and facing me said, three times. He went on, I grew up in Fort Hall, Idaho area. My earliest recollection was a camping trip as a small boy in the early 1960s. My father, cousin and I were walking through a canyon and something threw rocks the size of baseballs at us from afar. There was also the sound of timber cracking. My father told us we needed to leave the area as we were not wanted by the mountain people. Tell me about seeing one. I saw one in the afternoon on a dirt path below me in a small canyon. The Bigfoot was dragging a sage brush to erase his tracks and conceal his footprints. They will also step on stones so they can avoid making tracks. You mentioned three sightings you've had. Where? around Eel River, Trinity Forks, Snake River. Some people ask, if they are real, then why are there never any bones found? Do they bury their dead? Yes, but in water, weighted down in rivers or ponds with stones. So we're talking about an animal that is shy, clever, and territorial, all signs of an intelligent creature. They are more of a spirit than a human, Gary said. 
At this point, Gary seemed to lose interest and change the subject. I sensed the subject of Bigfoot was somewhat taboo for him to tell me about and not meant for non-tribal. Thank you, Todd C. Homer. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to enter the November giveaway contest. Just listen to the video linked on your screen and follow the instructions to enter. Thanks and good luck.